establish something tonight to better help each one of you how to look at this. But this arrow, as you see it here, and that one there, we're using that as a beginning point. Now, as we read last Sunday in Nehemiah, in the first chapter, how Nehemiah, he went before the king, and he appeared to be sad. But had it, but come up. <clears throat> we know according to Daniel's prophecy, it is mentioned in the ninth chapter, and I want, want to read in the 25th verse, know therefore, now the angel is explaining to Daniel how to begin to look at this subject. Know therefore, and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, or I mean for the coming of the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. Now let me phrase it like this. It, it is actually saying, Somewhere in front of you, Daniel, in time, there's going to be a decree made. The angel never said, by who or when. It's just the same way when we come to the last week. It plainly says, and he will make a covenant with many. He who? Well, we know the he who is the false prince. But the world is standing back tonight. Well, who could he be? Guessing. You know, brothers and sisters, that false prince is moving upon the world, and this world is sound at sleep. Because they're all trying to stick their nose in the Bible. Well, he's this. Some said a long time ago, Nero's coming back from the dead. Some said Judas is coming back from the dead. Others said, oh, it's going to be a Syrian. That's a lot of confusion. But we don't believe that that man of sin, whoever he is, that false prince, is going to catch everybody asleep. There's going to be a people on this earth that's going to know exactly to be able to recognize him. It's not going to catch them unaware. The church world is going to be sound at sleep. But there's going to be a few Annas. And there's going to be a few Simeon. Now, this lets us know Daniel wasn't alive when there did come a commandment or a decree. That's why when we search the scripture, all prophetic students will agree that the decree to build Jerusalem and the walls was not given by Cyrus when it was to build the temple in 500 and something BC. It came in Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah wasn't asking Artaxerxes to go back and build the temple. He wasn't crying about the temple. He was crying about the walls and the gates. They're in a mess. And when he got back there, brothers and sisters, he took the beast he'd been riding on. And it says there was no other men with him, only just certain one. They didn't then say he went out to see the temple and what shape it was in. He went out to circle the city and see what shape the walls was in. Nehemiah had that letter of authorization. And according then to Nehemiah's writing, it came. It started in the month of Nazareth. Now, when we refer to the month of Nazareth, that's part of March and the month of April.
and I said, don't anybody try to come over there in the suburban hospital so we won't be members of the parents. That's good. Gracious Lord. Yeah. 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 At this time, we pray for our sisters who've been in this accident. Yes, sir. Heavenly Father, may your merciful hand watch over them. Let there be nothing serious come of this, Lord. Comfort them and strengthen them. Heal their bruises, their injuries, whatever state they may be. You be the great physician, Lord that will undertake for them just now. We ask in Jesus Christ. Now, Brother Allen, if you don't mind, I want you to take this black marker and connect this line right here with that right there. So just connect the black line right straight down to you. I'm doing that to establish to you that the time factor we're dealing with is measured by that decree. Biblical students who have their men of education, they communicate with your observatories and all of those that keeps all the astronomical records of time. I ain't got time. I I wouldn't know what I was looking at. But I accept their general information that they get. That that month of niacin. And they, they determine, they fix the factor that this degree comes along about the 14th or the 15th of the month of niacin. So we'll just establish this decree came in the month of niacin. And I won't put any date to it. Hope you understand me now. And you who might ever see this on video, the month of Nisus is enough to establish a fixed beginning point for this prophecy to run its course. Therefore, this line right here to you, over to this point right there, I mean to this point right here, that line, 445, naturally it terminates right there, but we're continuing the line. That represents calendar time as you would read a calendar. Because calendar time is 365 and one fourth day. How many will realize that? Huh? But remember, before the Roman world and the Roman calendar became more or less than established later in the Christian era as the Western Universal Calendar, time was kept and recorded by the, we will say, the chronologists, the writers of history in relationship to the rise and reign of kings. Therefore, we're looking at this time. How many understand what I'm talking about? Now, because right there we've got this red line intercepted. We've got this, the death of Herod, come right in here. But we've got this arrow. That represents the birth of Christ. He was born sometime before the death of King Herod. You read it in the New Testament. Now when we're looking at this line, we're looking at AD on this side and BC on this side. But we see in here an overlapping period. Because the history that records the reign of kings coming down to here, and they cut it off right at, at King Herod's death. Therefore, that line runs, and we will say it runs parallel to the records of history written pertaining to King's reign. It was never established. We're back. And prior to King Herod's death, was Christ born? Now, but after the death of Herod, and the child grew up, then he come on the scene. It was then that the things he began to do left an impression upon the New Testament disciples and 
keep in mind, the New Testament was not even written the day that Christ was born. It was not even written the day that he was baptized. It was not even written the day that he was crucified. It was many years after the advent of the Holy Ghost that men began to pick up and see the importance of sending to writings the events as they were familiarized with what occurred in and around the life, the ministry of Jesus. So when we look at things like that, we're somehow or other in our minds, we're looking at histories, but we're also looking at events that shook the world. I got histories here. I'll hold them up so they can be seen on the camera. These are not comic books. They are recognized histories I have. This is a Dr. Robert Anderson. He is a British historian. Written about 1877. Not the particular book, but the subjects were in it. It's written about 1877. It's been copyrighted and republished many times since then. This is an old book written about 1917. It used to be used in our school. It tells us in this book that in the days of Caesar Augustus, that Jesus was born. He, may, he was the one that made the decree that all the world should be taxed. It also tells us in this book, this is written by a man by the name of Bloss, in 1800 and something. I got another one upstairs that I read out of last Sunday morning, 18 and 35. These two books that I have right there, the two on top, they both correlate that Jesus was born under the imperial reign of Caesar Augustus. One of them says that Caesar, Caesar Augustus lived 14 years after the birth of Christ. I happen to know, brothers and sisters, that Roman history that would be written would not be familiar with the actual birth of Christ. The birth of Christ only began to be, we will say, an interesting article after his baptism and his ministry started. It's only then men, to, men will begin to go back and quote we will say the records of bygone years and see where they can fit certain things in. Now then, I want you to notice something else. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. I'll show you how sometimes confusing when you look at mere writings that men will write and yet, within their mind, there is not an established fixed point to gauge time. In Matthew's account, in the second chapter, and if you've got a school for you, it'll tell you and show you approximate time that particular portion of Scripture fits in the time. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold there what came wise men from the east. And at the top of the page, it gives your time, B.C. 4. Now if we just assume well, that's accurate, then here's what it means. That Jesus was born four years before Herod died. But he wasn't. Now then, go with me to Luke. In the second chapter. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And you look at the top of the page, BC 5. You see the count? Go with me over to St. John's writing. We're going to pick up the, uh, the time Jesus is baptized. 
John the Baptist is the one that's doing the speaking. But it's the Apostle John who is writing the record of what John the Baptist said. The time that John wrote this, John the Baptist was dead. But John, the disciple, is giving mention of something John the Baptist said. Now, John the Baptist said this in the 18th verse. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him or revealed him. John made that statement as a testimony to the multitudes that came out to ask him, Who are you? Now they have done seen the episode of Christ at baptism. Matthew chapter 3 or 4. All right? And notice it says, A.D. 26. Now, brothers and sisters, if we look at A.D. 26, and yet, it plainly tells me in Luke, the third chapter. So go back to Luke with me. In the third chapter, it tells us, in the 21st verse, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized, and praying that heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape, like it dove upon him. And notice at the top of the page, it's got your... A.D. 26. Well, let's get on, get on down here. Like a devil upon him, and a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Verse 23. This is the part I want you to look at. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Now, what does that tell us? That don't mean he was 29 and a half. I'm not 64 yet. I'm just on my way to it. I don't understand what I mean by this statement. All right. Now then, with this, the reason I'm talking like this, and right at this point, you may not understand what I'm looking at. I'm just wanting you to realize there is no way possible if you're going to try to prove something by some historical record you may only get off out on a limb and not prove a thing because there's no date recorded where Jesus was born. But the one thing is we know he was born. But we do know that he was crucified. And the Jewish history gives us an account when he was crucified. Now what are we studying this subject for? We're studying it to find out if the prophecy was accurate and meant what it says. If the first 69 were accurate, the last week will be accurate. If the first 69 weeks terminated precisely, we will say, at the very closing of the 69th week, then so will the 70th one when it starts. It will close precisely seven years today. That's why, brothers and sisters, in the book of Daniel, it tells us in the book of Daniel that when the man of sin, the false prophet, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, comes, that there is a time, which is one year, times, plural, two years, and a half a time, a half a year. Not eight months, not ten months, a half a year. Then in Revelation, it tells us that the two prophets, will prophesy in the streets of Jerusalem for a thousand two hundred and three score days. Forty two months. Precisely. Not a thousand two hundred and ninety seven days. It's accurate and precise. And it tells us 
was also in Revelation chapter 12 that when that beastly system has literally been set in motion to fulfill the last week that it's in the last half of that 70th week that that man of sin he will break the covenant and that woman Israel will literally have to flee for her life and there's given a place in the wilderness somewhere where she's protected for the space of time a thousand two hundred and three score days if God's precise then brothers and sisters we have to begin to take a look at certain things and accept the fact 69 weeks terminated the very day that Jesus hung on the cross well Alan take your marker and I want you to put a cross right in there right above that line right there but that black cross are big enough that it'll, that it'll show on the the camera
They can write their histories and hunt all the years, the events, and everything. But God knows how many times their son comes up. How many times he's up. Now, if there's 483 years, what type of years are it? No, this is 365 and one fourth day calendar time. That's a solar year. It takes the earth to go around the sun. But we know also that our whole time factor in that respect is out of balance. So God still holds somehow or other a measuring line of 360 days each. Therefore, these 483 prophetic years are 360 days equal. Now, it so happens, according to Dr. Robert Anderson, that from the decree that Nehemiah had through the crucifixion of Christ, solar calendar time, there was 476 years and 24 days. That's solar time. But when you break it down into prophetic time, you get 483 years or, let me read it to you, what he says. 173,880 days. What does that mean? That's astronomical time. That's the way God looks down and the day that sun came up and Nehemiah had that decree, God knew that 69 weeks, 483 days, years are 173,880 days later when the sun sets. The 69 weeks has run its course. No matter what the calendar is written by. No matter whose picture's on it. No matter what the books of men's writings say. God's week will have terminated. So therefore, you don't look at these red lines beyond this point. Time to keep going. The cross. It came the end. And 69 prophetic weeks, 483 prophetic years of 360 days each, are 173,880 days. That meant the sun came up 173,880 times, and it set the same way. <coughs> now what does all of that sum up to? it summed up to this now I have to take you to some of my writings now do this so I won't leave anybody confused The life of Christ, from the solar standpoint, calendar-wise, he lived 33 and a half years. He was actually baptized in the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor, Roman Emperor Tiberius. He was baptized approximately, we'll say, six months before the first Passover he would attend in the spring of the year in the month of Nisan <coughs> and when he appeared in Jerusalem at the temple grounds in the month of Nisan to keep the first Passover after he has been baptized he entered the city with a whip read it will you read with me he entered the city with a whip He'd been there before as a young boy, but he didn't make a whip. He wasn't carrying a whip in his hand when he was baptized. He didn't carry a whip in the wilderness. He was 40 days out there. That's almost a month and a half. He comes back out of the wilderness. He still appeared a few days. When you pick up the first chapter of John's writing, 
It tells you, brothers and sisters, how that the next day certain disciples saw, you know, Jesus go by, and they was with John. And certain disciples run and asked Jesus, where do you live at? He says, come on, I'll show you. These are, we will say, are fragments of information that each one of the disciples go back and pick up a long time after the actual day that Jesus was baptized. Because in John's account, it would look like he was baptized one day, the next day he was seen by some of John's disciples, and they asked him where he's at, and then the next day he is in Cana doing the next miracle. No, you've got to fit these little fragments in to a pictorial background. Jesus was baptized, and Luke and Matthew, he was driven by the Spirit the first thing into the world. He didn't take out disciples or nothing. He went to the wilderness. After 40 days, he was tempted of the devil. Then he came out of the wilderness in the power and the spirit. He came right back, no doubt, in the same area on his way back to Nazareth. He didn't immediately go back to Nazareth. He just was more or less slowly making his way back there. But he went back down in the area where John was at was well, there he's going to get some disciples to follow him. And as they follow him, then he worked his way back to Nazareth. There that is where he has joined his mother. And he began to go around in the areas about and preaching in the synagogues. Now he's picked up his disciples, and then he is invited by his mother and his disciples to a wedding. To a wedding. There was where he did the first miracle. Shortly after that, brothers and sisters, he took his mother and his disciples and left Nazareth and came to Capernaum, according to John's account. And abode there just a few days, and the Jewish Passover was at hand. That's what John said. Now this all sums up means this. From the time that Jesus was baptized, somewhere in the fall of the year, wherein he began to be about 30 years of age. That lets you know, brothers and sisters, he had been born 30 years back in the fall of the year. We don't know what was in the middle of September, the last of September, the middle of October, but somewhere in the fall of our, what we call the sore year, he was born. Therefore, from his baptism to his first Passover, he had a half a year of ministry there, and mainly of it was in Cana, in Nazareth, and down in Capernaum, and in the various areas around the Sea of Galilee. That's why the scripture says, And they that sat in darkness saw a great light. But when, when the first Passover come, that you read about in John's account, brothers and sisters, he entered Jerusalem at the Jewish Passover season in the spring of the year, and he entered with a whip. Three years later, in the same season, he entered Jerusalem and did the same thing. Now then, why do I say all that? To establish the fact Jesus was 33 and a half years of age. Calendar time. Solar time. 365 and one fourth day. Good. Now then, when we break that down then into a prophetic time. When applying his lifespan into prophetic time, it equals to 34 prophetic years. Now then, I'm going to do something over here to better illustrate to you and maybe fix something in your mind that will leave a, an indelible impression. Brother Alan? Help me right here. Bud, your call. Help him here. It's the very end of that. Right there, so at the end of this horn, we'll start right there. And bring it right down through there. Now, bring it off right here. Bring it off right here and move that tape. That's that horn right there. Now there's some tape underneath here somewhere back there. 
We are looking at the time that has transpired, irregardless of the history. We are looking at the time that's major. Because God marked the day that that decree was handed into Nehemiah's hand. And in the mind of God, 69 weeks started. No matter what kings do, no matter who else is born, no matter what empires do, God measures every time the sun comes up and she goes out. Another day of that time has went by. Now, the death of Christ. If 173,880 days has transpired exactly, we know then that this decree in Didanda, let's read it again. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, started right here in the month of Nisan with Nehemiah, and to the build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, as we said last Sunday morning. That seven weeks is weeks of years, which means 49 prophetic years. So the first 49 years of this orange line is going to bring us somewhere right about in here. Brother Allen, I want you to put a dark line right across that right there. Right along about there. Approximately there. Make a good plan. That 49 years was definitely, as I said, last Sunday morning, the time. God has allotted those Jews under the authorization of that decree. Get them walls built. Get them gates restored. Get this fortification reset in motion so that the city can begin to be a place safe enough for the inhabitants to come, rebuild their houses, clear up the streets. No need to build houses if you ain't got a wall to protect them because that bunch of enemy out there is going to rip you to pieces. That's what me and I was worried about. Get them walls built. Get them gates up. No wonder old Sandbal and old Tobai they wanted to resist. All right. 49 years here. It brought us precisely to Malachi's prophecy. I'll show you in the num numer numbers in a minute just how precise and accurate it is. A lot of those men was dead and gone when Malachi came on the scene. When Malachi came on the scene, he saw the spiritual condition of the Jews. 49 years later, and read Malachi, the first two and three chapters. They were bringing their sick, cheating God. They're lame. A lamb half dead, torn to pieces. That's like the Jew today. I forget what year it was that the lamb was to have. I think it was last year. But in the Jerusalem most months in advance before the the Sabbath season for the land to rest when in effect it was an article in the Jerusalem Post and the Jews were getting together well what are we going to do with this land and here was the idea they weren't going to let the land rest they are going to rent it and lease it to the heirs so they would go ahead and farm it and they could get the rent off of it legally it looked like they was they weren't farming it but the dirty rascals they was leasing it to the heirs. See, that, that's what you've got to look It's how people like to cheat God. On one standpoint, it looks legal. But when you receive the reality of it, it's hypocrisy. And that's what Malachi was rebuking. And that's why God said, later it says, You offer polluted bread. He said, I won't even look at your Solomon assembly and such like. Now, all of 
that spiritual condition they had allowed to affect them is what funds that Jewish nation for the next 400 years. The 62 week period, which carries all the there. And in troublous times, the city and the walls and the streets will be cleaned up, cleared up. And brother, when I begin to read the histories, this blot right here, that's an old history. But he goes in detail, telling the wars, how many Jews in periods of time, right there in that Columbus period, was literally massacred by various lords of the various breakouts of the ancient empires, especially the Persians and the Greeks. Israel was the crossroads of the old world. All trade routes from Africa to Asia had right to the Holy Land. Jerusalem was like Louisville, Kentucky, or Chicago. It's a hub of interstate commerce. You can imagine what Jerusalem would be. Traders from every direction coming, trading their wares. Whatever they brought, whatever they did, whatever kind of news they brought and spread in the city of Jerusalem, sooner or later it's going to affect the lifestyle of these Jews. And a lot of them Jewish politicians, brothers and sisters, they sold themselves to these foreign lords, these kings of these empires. And many of them betrayed their own people, just like we've got a bunch of political Jews today. Perez, Rabin, they don't want to begin. Oh, Begin, he had his eyes on Judah. He believed in the coming of the Messiah. All right. Now then, let me read this slowly now. As this decree began, the first seven weeks, or 49 years, brought us to about 397 solar calendar time. But in actuality, brothers and sisters, it brought us 400 years before the birth of Christ prophetic now let me read this to you the first seven weeks was 49 years prophetic time the 62 weeks after it has run its course when the Messiah was cut off covered 434 prophetic years now then I've done say, stated to you Therefore, the life of Jesus fulfilled the last 34 years of this. Right here. So I don't put a mark right here. The last 34 years of that script, prophetic time. Jesus' life covered a span of 12,236 days, allowing for 400 prophetic years to be fulfilled between here and here. Prophetic time. 49, and the last 34, all of this in the 400 between, all of that astronomical time, that's how God sees when the sun comes up to you. Sun comes up to you. He don't pay two cents to the calendar. He's looking how many times the sun comes up. And he knows what he set this time in motion. Now look. When you look at this then, from this standpoint, the correct BC time that had elapsed from this coming right down through here the correct BC time that had elapsed to the birth of Christ right here at this line was 442 years 203 days how many understand 
understand what I meant? That's when God's not looking at your calendar. That means 442 actual years and 203 days after that decree went in effect, Jesus was born. God knew that man would have time messed up. Still messed up. Now then, as I read in Dr. Anderson here, according to the astronomical records they had then to work with, it refers to the London Observatory, a certain astronomer that he, he uh, corresponded with to get certain uh, astronomical information concerning the new moons and so forth. He writes and records that Jesus was crucified on April the 6th in the year 32 AD. Now then, I've got another little Jewish book. Let's see what the Jew says. This is an old Jewish history book come from England it was used in Jewish schools, printed in 1800 and something. Here's their chronological record of the event that led to the, to the period of the Emperor Tiberius and the revolt of both the Romans later. I'm going to read you what they say. It's just talking about Pilate here. Pilate fell upon the populace and cut them down indiscriminately. It was under the rule of Pilate that the events narrated in the New Testament occurred. Jeshua called Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth, became a noted as a teacher of his seen doctrine. See, that's how the Jews look at it. Now, and put to death by the Romans in the Jewish year of 3,801 or 33 CE, the Christian era. Now, all because, brothers and sisters, history and man, how they've tried to fix the calendar to make everything come out, they never will get it. There's only one thing they can do. They've got a means of accuracy now. But they can't go back, brothers and sisters, and rewrite history. About six years ago, I believe it was, when we were coming back from California, we came from Tulsa, Oklahoma. We stayed all night there. I bought a paper. And at that time, brothers and sisters, this article went in. These were Christian scientists in London, England. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read the entire thing to get this information in. Why? So we can establish some kind of concrete approximity when Christ died as far as we're looking at a calendar. The exact date uh, of Jesus Christ's crucifixion has been debated for centuries. See what they say about it? In respects, even Dr. Anderson here refers to other men. They put Jesus born as far back as 7 B.C. Well, see, when you try to mess around with stuff like that and bring it after here, you're all confused. But when you look at his life, that he had to be 33 and a half years old, some words you have to forget about some other things. Now then, but two British scientists say they have concluded with reasonable certainty that Christ died on Friday, April the 3rd, in the year 33. That coincides with the Jewish history, according to the Lord. Now, Colin J. Humphreys and we, W.G. Waddington, both of Oxford University said in an article published today in the British magazine, Nature, 
They base their conclusion on astronomical calculations and biblical and historical reference. But it's all because they've got this modern computer technology. And these, these huge astronomical computers can just absolutely do things, brothers and sisters, that's it's almost mind-boggling. Now, the scientists said they were able to reconstruct the Jewish calendar at the time and to date a lunar eclipse that the Bible and other historical sources suggest followed the crucifixion. If accepted, the scientists wrote, these calculations allow the day, month, and year of the crucifixion to be, to be determined precisely. Now, the only certainty in the past about the date of Christ's crucifixion, they wrote, was that it occurred between the years 26 and 36. They're referring to the years of Pontius Pilate, was Roman procurator of Judah. Now see, in other words, that's when you look at the pages of Pilate's 10-year record. Now, nearly every year in this period has its advocates, they wrote. While the day of the execution is also uncertain since there appears to be a difference of one day between the date given by the Gospel of John and that indicated by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They said all four Gospels in the biblical agree that Jesus died a few hours before the start of the Jewish Sabbath, nightfall on a Friday, and that within a day it was the time of the Passover, the annual Jewish feast held at the full moon. They said Passover time was precisely specified in the official festival calendar of Judah, used by the priest of the temple. Lambs were slaughtered between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. on the 14th day of the Jewish month, Nisan, which corresponds to March and April in the modern Western calendar. The Passover meal began at moonrise that evening at the start of the 15th of Nisan. Through a series of complicated and closely reasoned calculations, the two scientists concluded that Jesus died at the same time as the Passover lambs were slain. This is consistent with many New Testament statements such as Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, they wrote. By a process of elimination, they went on to, to conclude that within the decade from AD 26 to 36, the only possible year for the crucifixion to have occurred was 33. Now here tells why. In the second half of their article, the scientists turned to references in the book, in the Bible, in the Apocrypha, to the moon being turned to blood, saying that in our view, the phrase probably refers to a lunar eclipse, in which case the crucifixion can be dated unambiguously. The reason an eclipse moon is blood red is well known, they wrote. Even though the moon is geometrically in the Earth's shadow, Sunlight still reaches it by, by refraction in the Earth's atmosphere and is reddened by having traversed a long path through the atmosphere where scattering of light per, per preferentially removes the blue end of the spectrum. Now, see, you're talking and stuff that I don't know a thing about, but I read it just for the sake of educated people. We have, deter we have determined the eclipse relevant to our work by the use of the most comprehensive data available in the light of Babylonian records and long-term changes in the Earth's rate of rotation. They said that after listing all lunar eclipses visible from Jerusalem between the years 26 and 36, during those 10 years of pilot reign, they found there is only one lunar eclipse at Passover time visible from Jerusalem, and that was Friday, April the 3rd, 33 years. The Acts of the Apostles has Peter, leader of the twelve disciples, quoting the prophet Job before a crowd in the last days, God says, I will show wonders in the heavens above, the sun will turn to darkness and the moon blood before that great and glorious day of the Lord come. The scientists said the mechanism by which the sun was darkened may have been a chasm, dust storm. A chasm is a hot wind that blows in the region. The scientists concluded in inter interpretation of Peter's record in terms of a lunar eclipse is therefore not only astronomically and counter calendaristically possible, but it also allows us with reasonable certainty to depict Friday the 3rd of April, AD 33, as being the date of Christ's crucifixion. I let that stand for the record. Now, I'm going to read just
touch some points here just for the sake of this portion of the message and then the next time we'll try to go to deal with the sin that we just saw. My purpose in preaching this message in these days and times is to give people some historical data as along with just what I've read which is modern scientists astronomical studies and you know brothers and sisters no matter how writers down here on earth can lose account of certain things because writing in histories and things like that yet when we look at the sun how many times it rises it's not up there bouncing around backwards and forwards and, and getting mad off and people. No, that sun rises just as steady as it's just a little bit. That's the problem. That's why, brothers and sisters, when God gave this to Daniel, God knew that the Jewish nation, no doubt, as a whole, would never observe. You would think that the Jewish rabbis, the scribes, those men who actually had to be credentialed men to rewrite the prophets, that is, in other words, as a manuscript would become old and wore out, they, were, they had to be qualified that they could recopy it precisely. So accurately. And the priest who ministered and read the law to the people, you would have thought Daniel would have had a greater influence. They would have somehow or other been looking back and say, now gentlemen, our father somewhere was given a decree because it was in black and white to the building of the walls and the clearing up of the streets. By the time, brothers and sisters, Christ has come on the scene, the walls of Jerusalem have now been restored in many years. That city is inhabited. I think the guy told us the old city of Jerusalem in and around the time of Christ the old wall city itself covered approximately four square miles of surface. You would have thought those Jewish rabbis in the days of Jesus would have looked at their city and began to realize, well, our city is good. Why did Herod modernize that temple like he did? That was 40 some years in his modernizing. Well, he knew there had been some men, and he took over the reins 40 some years before Christ. And he knew he was he was governor of some people that was completely rebellious to Roman rule. But the Romans up, appointed him. And because he knew that these people could cause his throne to be upset, he set about a great taxation. And he thought, I'll appease these people. I'll be good to them. I'll build them a temple. But they'll have to rejoice and say, that that's for our Messiah. You know, the disciples told you, 40 and some years was this. You mean tear it down and you raise it up in three days? When Jesus came that day and told them, money changed it up, he knew that temple wasn't used to stay. That had been built by an apostate ruler. Claiming to be a king, he wasn't king of the Jews. When Zedekiah was taken 500 or something before Christ's brothers and sisters and taken back to Babylon, his children was killed. That was the last actually Jewish king that ever sat on the throne of David until the Messiah came. So that temple wasn't. But those rabbis should have known that that prophecy of them is saying right away. And it was accurate and precise. When Jesus the night that he rose from the dead, and that night on the first day of the week he came with eleven, was that? And they were scared to death. He came in among them and upbraided them for their unbelief beginning with the Psalms and the Prophets. He opened their understanding by the Scripture. Do you think he let Daniel out? I hardly think he did. I believe he showed them precisely time. Now from Calvary to now, we've been living in a span of time which the measurement of time doesn't get applied. The reason I say this tonight, when Brother Branham 
back there about 1962 preached the 70 weeks of Daniel and so emphatically he laid it out there is one week seven year period left yet to be fulfilled brothers and sisters then when the question was asked and he referred to the same thing in preaching the seal he said there's three and a half years left for the Jew people have jumped for three and a half years having no knowledge whatsoever of the Bible or history because it's a subject they ain't got mind enough to investigate and God knew there was that way that's why God could just say well since you're just going to take what the man says verbatim irregardless whether it's right or wrong and I'll give you a statement that will send you down the road that you never for 20 something years ago we're wrong, they're right. But I know this. That week of Daniel's in front of us somewhere. It's going to be him over. And once it, now the sad part of it is, brothers and sisters, don't think God's going to scream from heaven, hey, you down there, the seventh week is on, in effect. No. The seventh week will start when somehow or other the prophetic world will be forced to come together in their carnal efforts. That man of sin, somehow or other, will be ushered to the forefront. Once he does take over, he will make a decree, a command, with me or one week. It's not necessarily that he draws it up on a seven-year basis, no. It is a decree or a commandment for perpetual peace, prosperity, tranquility, never the end. But God will see it up. Once it started, I know. not when Germany signs it, not when Italy signs it, not when Persia signs it, not when Greece signs it. It's when Israel puts her seat. The day that apostate political Jew signs that agreement, the sun will rise and set. So many days. One day she'll go down, never to rise on the same purpose and trend as he had through those 1,203 score days of that dark tribulation period or the completeness of that seven year period of time itself. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that means Daniel's seventh week. Shall the sun be dark and the moon shall draw us light. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the coming of the sun. Well, <clears throat> Lord willing, my <clears throat> next week and the next time we will try to take the seventh week and finish up the seventh. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that what's been said can be understood. As children of God, and Lord, that we can grow and progress by it. I thank you for my brothers and sisters, and thank you, Lord, for your word of truth. And the spirit of truth you gave us to guide and lead us. Bless every one of us, Lord. Help us to walk with our eyes open and our ears unstopped. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. He
speak as I have gathered thee for this purpose that I might inform thee and give thee an assurance thou hast heard my word I have gave to thee an understanding and I say unto thee tonight my children take these things not because thou hast heard a mortal man but because thou hast heard from my throne of mercy I have gave thee ability to grasp these things to cherish them to thine heart for these are the jewels these are things of great price if thou canst value them and realize these are things that I have kept from the world for they would only pollute these things but to those that I have called to be my own and I have cleansed with that of my blood then I cherish thee and I share these things with thee that thou mightest guard them in thy heart and cherish them in thy soul because they shall be meat to thy inner being they shall be the strength 